шановні колеги, адвокати, раді вас вітати на нашому сьогоднішньому заході. В нас сьогодні шанований колега з Шотландії. Тема дуже актуальна і цікава. Цифрові докази, які набувають, тема набуває надзвичайної актуальності саме під час воєнного стану і допоможе нам розібратися в цьому наш колега із Шотландії. Для представлення я б хотів би запросити Олександра Черних, керівника представництва Національної асоціації адвокатів України в Шотландії, відомого адвоката. Будь ласка, вам слово. Доброго дня, шановні колеги. Саву, дякую за запрошення. Колеги, ради вам відрекомендувати відомого експерта Безіла Манонососа з напіру університету міста Единбурга, який займається питаннями кіберправа, кібердоказів. Є відомим експертом, який викладає і для юристів, для адвокатів, для прокурорів, також для поліцейських детективів Інтерполу. Курс в нього дуже великий, але він для Національної асоціації адвокатів України і Вищої школи адвокатури зробив короткий двочасовий двогодинний курс загального введення в цифрові докази, які він зараз і пропонує на цій увазі. Дуже дякую Безілу за цю можливість, це його щирий внесок в нашу допомогу, нашу перемогу, це його допомога в тому, щоб Україна мала сучасне забезпечення і доводила вину усіх винних осіб для забезпечення справедливості і правопорядку. Дякую. Thank you, Basil. And you can begin. Let's start with our election. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you, Sava. Thank you, everyone, for inviting me and having me with you today. Uh, as Alexander said, I'm Basil, I'm the manager of the Cyber Academy at Napier University, but today I'm here as, in my capacity as an expert witness uh, in uh, digital forensics. And um, my specialty is dealing with digital evidence, especially for uh, criminal cases. And um, digital evidence is something that every day it's going to be more and more uh, important for um, uh, uh, every kind of court case from um, a family court to an employment tribunal to a criminal case. And unfortunately, in the case of uh, Ukraine for, uh, you know, uh, uh, tribunals for war crimes uh, and things like that uh, uh, after the end of the conflict. And I hope that something like this uh, and any other future seminars we can organize later can help you understand how digital evidence can help you in your cases, no matter what kind of cases that you are dealing with. So I'll just put through the, my slides, just bear with me. I'm sorry for any background noise, uh, but I am at the university and it's a bit, it's a bit busy. So I uh, hope it doesn't bother you a lot. So can you all see my screen? Yes, yes, we see. Yeah, fantastic, thank you very much. So um, as I said, I'm an expert witness in digital forensics. Uh, I'm also a visiting lecturer at Sheffield Hallam University and uh, the Faculty of Law at the Catholic University of Lyon. And I'm working with uh, the West Lothian College not far away from here. Um, um, I'm working as a guest speaker and contributor at Interpol's uh, um, uh, project leader, and I'm registered as a, the roster of experts with the International Telecommunications Union. I'm also working a lot with the legal profession in Scotland. That's why uh, um, we had this connection with uh, Alexander in the first place. Uh, and um, it is... Um, uh, I'm, I'm involved with different uh, uh, subcommittees and committees at the Law Society of Scotland. One of these, actually, uh, I will start as a chair of the Digital Evidence Working Group. So, 
we'll start with digital evidence, but evidence uh, as we used in criminal cases. And there's uh, some questions that you need to ask yourselves to understand digital evidence. How do we investigate it? How do we source our evidence? Where do we find our evidence? Um, do we always need to have evidence, new evidence to disprove something? And does the police and prosecutors understand digital evidence? I will start a little bit from the last question. And the last question um, about whether the police and the prosecutors understand the digital evidence. My experience when I started almost 15 years ago was that the police was back left behind in terms of uh, uh, their understanding of evidence. But throughout the years, they developed, they start getting more and more uh, well-trained and well-educated uh, um, staff uh, with their masters in cybersecurity and digital forensics. And that made their labs and their work obviously much better. The problem is that the prosecutors did nothing like that. So I'm looking back at the conviction rates on, on crimes like uh, child pornography. And it is now the same as it was 15 years ago. It's like nothing changed. But we do know that something has changed. The police is doing a better job. They get more, more and better evidence. They create better reports. So the one thing that is, uh, is on the other part of the equation is the prosecutors. And that is where the problem is, that the prosecutors don't have the training, don't have the investment, and they usually are so overworked, they have a backlog that is making things becoming worse and worse. And while the police is moving forward, the prosecutors are where they were 15 years ago. And the gap between them becomes bigger. So I'm going to talk to you about some cases of uh, real cases that I've worked on. And I don't know what the rate is in, uh, in Ukraine, but in England, only 5% of criminal cases that were prosecuted would end up in court. The other ones will either be dropped or people will plead guilty the last minute to get a smaller sentence, and that will be the end of it. So the first one is part is uh, is a small element from uh, things that I've seen many times. So you see a police report that says that um, the suspect uh, searched for child pornography on Google, and then they found a URL, uh, which is a record uh, of a file on his computer drive that. The file name was called 12 year old kiddie.avi. So it was a video and it implied the file name implied that it was about a 12 year old child. Also, the report would say that the file could not be recovered because uh, the data was corrupted and it was in the unallocated space, which meant that it had been deleted. Other things were overwritten, so they couldn't restore the file. All they could see from the file was the name, not the content. So here's the thing, is that evidence? It turns out that this, is not, this in itself, as you see it on this slide, is not evidence. It's an indication that something has happened. It's an indication that this might be a suspect file, but unless you watch the video, you don't know what's inside. So the whole rule about doing something beyond any reasonable doubt will stop you. There is every doubt. You, do, you, you cannot tell what was the content. Yes, the file name is, is damning. You know, you, it's, it's pretty clear what it was. But you cannot put someone in prison because something smelled like that or it looked like that. You have to have definite proof. Also, the, word, the Google search for child pornography in itself is not a crime. If you are, it is a crime to download pictures and watch pictures or videos. It's not a crime to Google and read articles or papers or books about it. 
if you look for that, you may come across academic papers or articles or newspapers that are talking about child pornography. Reading those articles is not a crime. So this cannot be taken into consideration unless you have actually found pictures of children and videos of children, and you use that to show that there was intent. Okay, because you cannot prove just by that what the person was looking for. And look at the file name, 12-year-old YO Kiddy. So if you look at wor words like child porn or kiddie porn or things like that, if you get a clean computer that just got installed, okay, and you start using it even without connecting to the internet, these words are going to show up on your hard disk drive. And they're going to show on your hard disk drive because these are words that exist in the, doc in the dictionaries. So if you have installed Microsoft Office, Microsoft Word, and you have installed the English dictionaries, those words are going to be there. So if you are looking for, if you found those words on the computer drive, you need to put them into context. You need to see each hit you have for of those words to see the background and see, is it part of an article? Is it part of a dictionary or is it something else? So even if when you find digital evidence, putting that into context is very important. Now the next case is a case where um, a lady, let's call her Mrs. A, she goes to a police station and she says uh, that another uh, man, let's call him Mr. B, was sending threatening messages. Now the messages were one and a half years old. Okay. They were not like yesterday or last week. Uh, so the officer at the station, police officer takes some screenshots, put them on a report and gives the phone back to the lady. The police does not examine the suspect's phone and they just send the information to the procurator fiscal the fiscals are the prosecutors in Scotland. And the fiscals, on the base of those screenshots, they actually charge the person. Now, here's the problem. First of all, they didn't check his mobile phone, so they cannot have any record that shows that on his mobile phone that he sent those messages. The only other reliable source would be to have the records from the telephone operator, the mobile phone operator. One and a half years later, operators do not keep records. They keep records up to a year. Whatever, there is no rule about exactly how much, but the industry standard in the UK is one year, which is as much as you may need it for business purposes. Okay, if someone comes three years later and says, oh, you shouldn't have billed me for that call, you know, it's a historical issue. So, I was uh, asked by the defense lawyer to see what, uh, uh, what could be done. And as I said, there were no records from both sides, neither from the lady, not from the, the gentleman who was the suspect. So what I did, I used um, uh, a website called sharpmail.co.uk. There's many websites like that where you actually can open an account put money with your credit card, and you can send text messages uh, that can appear to be from anyone. And that is a marketing tool. So HSA, for example, can say, oh, we want to send a set text messages to all our members for Basil's uh, webinar. You send to, and it says HSA, you don't have to have a number. But if you actually type a number and that, that number is correct, then whoever receives the message, they can reply to that number. So I'd use that and I spoofed messages to the lawyers and they were shocked how easy it was to do that. And then I sent messages from the lady's number, 
I had the number, so I, I did it as a proof of concept. Took a picture because it was quite old. The, my mobile phone at the time was an old BlackBerry. There were no uh, screenshots. You had to take a picture of the, of the screen back then. And um, what happened is that I wrote a report about how this happened. There was no actual evidence. This is, this is a strange thing. And then I put on my report, it was a proof of concept, and then the prosecutors dropped the case because they realized that they could not prove anything because they didn't understand the evidence. So it wasn't a forensic report that dropped the case. It was a proof of concept. It was like an like like academic paper, like what something like a student would have written. It was that bad. <laughs> this is the screenshot from the actual website at the time when I sent the message. I sent the two number was my, my own number and the from was the lady's number. Now, the next case was uh, it's quite interesting. A woman uh, I went to the police and said that her ex-husband was staying outside her house, you know, across the street for uh, an hour. Uh, the lady had a restraining order, so the husband was not allowed to be anywhere near the house. Um, she reported what time he was there, supposedly, and the police had to investigate. And again, the prosecutors charged him without any real evidence. The guy was actually a bad guy. He was an ex-policeman. He was beating his wife. He went to prison for that. He got out of prison. He had lost his job. Uh, he wasn't a nice guy anyway. But was there evidence that he had actually violated the restraining order? What I had to do then is to find out if there's any evidence that can help his case. And the average person is going to be where their mobile phone is. Your mobile phone is with you right now. So it will show your location and that's it. All I need to do is prove where, if the, where his mobile phone was and if it was away from the locus away from the lady's house. And it will be the problem of the prosecutor to show that the mobile phone was away, but he was not with his mobile phone. Okay, the burden of proof would be again with the prosecutors. So I look at that, I look at the evidence. I ask for the cell site data from the operator and I ask for the Eastings and Northings. And Easting and Northings are, I'm not going to go into technical details, but Eastings and Northings are information about every antenna of mobile phone telephony that shows which direction on the map that part of the antenna is pointing. So the most antennas basically they have three elements, 120 degrees each, and all together they make 360 degrees. So it's a perfect circle. So actually 130 degrees, so there's like five degrees on each side so people can move around without losing signal. But the, each side, you know, has a northern and an eastern, and, you know, uh, by knowing where that is, you know which side of the antenna the mobile phone was. Because it's one thing to say the mobile phone was within a kilometer of the antenna, but which side? Okay, and if it's in the highlands, if it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in an empty space, it may not be very relevant. If it's in the city, it makes a big difference. So this is the information I got from the provider. And then I put all the information I had on Google Maps. And these three corners of this triangle are the addresses of the three antennas that we saw here. 
And the antennas, I knew which direction they were pointing. So the green arches are the, uh, the Greek segments are the direction of the antennas. And if you look at here, all of them have a common area in the middle of the triangle. And the middle of the triangle was actually the apartment of the accused. And the, the house of the ex-wife was somewhere between the red and the blue uh, markers here by the water. And that is actually uh, the issue. He could not have been anywhere here because if, if his mobile phone was as it looked like uh, in his apartment, uh, he could get signal from all three antennas. All he had to do is move from, from the kitchen to the toilet to the living room. And from a different side of the apartment, he would face a different antenna. And even if he was getting a signal, let's say from the one on the top left, uh, it wouldn't explain how he could go from here to the waterfront and back here in three minutes or four minutes and get a signal from here. So the, the, the records from the three antennas were in small, small gaps that wouldn't explain how he could go there and back. And also he was, the accusation was that he was, he was there for an hour. So that didn't make any sense. Uh, so the, prosecutor had, the prosecution had no way to actually prove that he was away from his mobile phone. So they actually had to drop the case. And as I said earlier, I looked for on Google Maps to see if there was enough time for him to go, go to the ex-wife's place, stay there and come back. There was no time. And uh, the jury and the judge on this case actually agreed that it didn't make any sense. The next case is actually the first case I investigated with police health evidence. And that was um, at what is, it doesn't exist, this police force doesn't exist anymore. They're all part of Police Scotland, uh, the Dumfries and Galloway Constabulary. At the time, that constabulary was the smallest police force in the United Kingdom. And the case was a drugs related case. So the lawyer asked me to examine the mobile phone of the accused. Um, the accused was actually a drug dealer. Um, the police was chasing him on the motorway. Um, he was together with his friend, they were throwing bags of drugs uh, out <laughs> from the car. They would throw the mobile phone and the mobile phone's battery out of the car uh, and things like that. So the police got the mobile phones, put them together. So I had to look at, uh, at the evidence. And this is the actual mobile phone and the battery as they were held by evidence. The thing is that when uh, the day before I went to, uh, down there, um, I used the tool that I had on my laptop to check on my own mobile phone, which was also a Nokia uh, with a Symbian operating system. And I said, okay, it's working, that's great. When I was going on the train, I tried one more time and it wasn't working. I was really scared. I said, oh my God, you know, I'm going to be embarrassed over there. So what I did was that when I arrived, I asked the police to repeat their investigation with their own tool and give me the data set. And I said, I already have the original data set. I see you perform the uh, examination again. The two data sets will be the same. If they are the same, that's, that's fine. There was nothing else. There was nothing in the text messages to argue. But I was lucky. Uh, it wasn't that I was good. I was lucky. That was the very, very start of my career. Um, 
the tool was not returning the results they did before. And they tried different settings and it wasn't working. So at the end, I ended up with a data set that was different from the original. So if you look at here, the, the original examination, it had 54 contacts, which was the same, but then there were dial calls, answered calls, missed calls, and all of them were missing. They couldn't, re they couldn't recover them. Not only that, they actually recovered more text messages uh, in the second examination. So I said to, um, I said on my report, the police have compromised the evidence in four different ways. You cannot trust that evidence and that's it, that was my report. And that was the end of it. The truth is later on, as I got more experience, um, I found out why they lost it. Uh, they actually lost it the moment they opened up the mobile phone to check it for me, because back then storage was very small on the mobile phones and any call records more than 30 days would be wiped automatically so they can make space for more uh, fresh records. So the police actually destroyed that evidence just by switching on the mobile phone. And the other thing about the messages is that if you examine the same uh, mobile phone a year later and you have a new version of the tool, it will be more improved and it's more likely that it can actually recover more stuff later on. Anyway, the, the bottom line is that um, the evidence was compromised and um, that was it. And I don't know if you like ever watch like watching uh, CSI, Crime Scene Investigation, uh, but this character, Gil Grissom, was uh, the kind of person who would be not a policeman, but a scientist. And if he had a theory, he would actually run uh, um, an experiment to prove his theory. And he would do that because if you cannot repeat the same experiment, then your data is not correct. And this is the problem with the police. The tool had a glitch that was not updated at the time. That's why that, that was one of the issues. But because both they had two investigators, one civilian and one police officer, they used the same tool they repeated the same error, the two faulty results would be the same. Where if they used an, a different tool, they would have a discrepancy. And in that case, you would use a third tool to see which, if the third tool agrees with one of the other two. Later on, I uh, had a case uh, where I was actually on the defense of a police officer. His name was Paul Renfrew, and I have his uh, uh, um, agreement to use his name here. So Paul Renfrew was accused that for breach of peace and assault. Uh, he was living with his girlfriend. They broke up. He actually let her live uh, in the flat for a month. He went with his children back to his father for a month. Uh, she did not find any other place to live. She wanted to just stay there for free for as long as she could. He started, uh, he took her, his lawyer to start an eviction process. And the night before the eviction, he was calling her and texting her continuously to get to her, to convince her not to let things go bad the next day when the police and the, uh, uh, and the, how do you call it, the, the legal the presents of the court will show up with the eviction notice. So um, she called the police and she said that he was banging the door and she was afraid and that is assault in, uh, uh, in Scotland. And he then uh, was charged. It took the police two months to charge him. Okay. Um, and when he asked for the CCTV to prove where he was parked at the time, they said, oh, uh, we could, you cannot have it because we are writing on the tapes over after one month. 
So his lawyers asked for the operator to give the cell site information. I look at the cell site information uh, at the time. And I also conducted a control experiment to see if the evidence from the control experiment would show that his mobile phone was close to the locus, close to the uh, place of the alleged offense. So I got the initial um, uh, the initial calls records. This is the actual record here. And as you can see the record, it has the date and the time. It tells you if it's a originating or uh, incoming. So these are originating calls. They originate from the mobile phone itself. As you will see, there are some that have a few seconds duration. The other ones have zero seconds duration. The ones that are zero seconds are SMS messages because messages don't have a duration. They either go through or they don't. And these are the phone numbers. And here you will see some information. This is the postcode in the, this is the format of the postcodes in the United Kingdom. So every antenna is somewhere and that somewhere has a postcode. So that antenna has the same postcode of the location where it is. And it tells you a single postcode if it's a text message, but if it is a call, it tells you the postcode where it started and the postcode where the phone ended. That here means that that person had not moved away from that antenna, had not gone to the area of another antenna because they are the same. The ID numbers of the antennas are, are the same. This is a map that the operator will provide to you. And the map here shows you how the signal was, how the signal was prevalent that time. And if you look at here, you will see, this is Greenock. This is where the alleged offense took place. The accused said he was somewhere here on the, how do you call it, on the, by the water. Um, the house was somewhere here in the, on the side, but he would sometimes get signal from the other side of the River Clyde instead of getting signal from inside the city. That actually made sense because inside the city, there is a lot of buildings and they block the signal. Where if you are on the waterfront, you can easily get from the from very far away from the other side of the river because there is no obstacle. It's a clear view and you can just get the signal. And so as I said, I conducted an experiment and I used his own mobile phone. I made calls to his phone from mine. I made calls from my mobile phone to his phone, and then I got the records. But for this time, for every call and text message that was sent or received, I had written everything down. I knew exactly where I was, and I knew exactly where the mobile phone was. So when I got the message, the, the data, you know, this is a, a plan of his flat, his apartment outside the corridor, inside the flat, uh, outside, around the building. So I did all that. I got the records. Every spot here was recorded on paper, so I knew exactly where I was. And then I got these two, um, um, how do you call it, these two uh, columns. The first one is the occurrences of the antennas in the the time of the alleged offense. And the second one was at the time of the control experiment. And if you look, these numbers do not match at all. There will always be some discrepancy because of the weather, the, how busy the lines were and everything. But look at this one, for example. This one was at the time of the offense appeared only twice out of 37 times. This was appeared 22 out of 24. Okay. The, the numbers are actually uh, uh, totally relevant. There's no pattern. And if you visualize them, if you put them on a graph, 
and you will see the blue ones are the original data and the yellow ones are the control experiment, there is no pattern. There's no match. There's no way that that mobile phone had been on the same place both times. So I calculate the probability that he was not of the locus was more than 91%. That's beyond any reasonable doubt. <laughs> But I mean, actually, that creates a lot of reasonable doubt for the prosecution. Um, let me just check how we're doing for time. Ah, we're doing okay for time. So um, the next one was about someone who was accused of being in a possession of child pornography. So he was in possession of two indecent images of children, but it was only two, there were not many. And they were not in the photo gallery, they were in the Google photo app, which means that they could have been uploaded from a computer, from a public computer, from wherever. Uh, when they seized his mobile phone, they seized some other uh, cards. And one of the cards that they had, uh, had file names that suggested indecent images of children, but no pictures, no videos, nothing. It was just a record of file names. And the problem was that the police seized from the crime scene, oh, well, from the place where they executed the warrant, they seized seven items, but the report only referred to two of the seven items. And normally the police should mention the other five and explain why they were not investigated. Maybe they were broken, maybe they were irrelevant, but there was no mention on that. So the defense lawyer noticed that. He asked me, I said, well, there's nothing on the report. So you should ask the police officers in the court, uh, where are those items? So he asked about those things and the police had no idea. And the prosecutors had no idea where those five out of seven items were. The police had actually lost them or misplaced them. And I can tell you that the judge was not very happy. So one of the things that happened is that I went to, um, um, uh, I went to the police, I, I contacted the police to see the evidence and uh, they said, oh, you need to bring your Celebrite dongle. Celebrite is a tool for use for mobile phone forensics. And I, sell, I said, I don't have a licensed dongle for Celebrite, I use something else. Can I just use your dongle or can you just extract the information I want? The information is the metadata the, the, the text information inside the pictures from only two pictures. It would take them 30 seconds to do that and put them on an email. And they said, oh, it's your job to have the right tools and training is not our job to provide you with the evidence you ask. So I did get a copy of the police report from the prose prosecutors, but the police was not cooperative. So when I went back to the court, I told the judge that, um, access to the police evidence was vendor dependent. And the judge again was not very happy. And when he asked me if I still want to get access, I said, no, uh, I'll go without examining the evidence. And that was because the police report was so bad and the, the prosecutors had not understood anything. So the case would be dropped. I knew that the case would be dropped. It was, it was really that bad. Um, so, when the police uh, expert trying to explain a few things, he was making things more complicated. When the judge asked him what the creation means, creation date of the pictures meant, he was coming, he said, oh, it can be this or that or the other. And that was the case, but he couldn't give a proper answer to the, uh, to the judge. So what I had done is that I had actually uh, 
made an experiment to see how the creation dates correspond to where the pictures are in the Google Photo app. Uh, so I had that information, which was in my report. And then when he said that um, uh, he was asked if they look, if they checked about Google's uh, um, records uh, and logs to see if um, um, if Google had um, the Google log show where the pictures were uploaded from, because my client was a truck driver and he was using Internet Cafe all the time. So if he was in London and the pictures were uploaded from Northern Ireland, then that would have been a problem for the prosecution. But the police had not checked that. And when they were asked if why, what do they mean when they manually browse the images, which means that they just click on the images and open them, um, the lawyer asked them, when you do that, are you actually changing the pictures? And uh, and the four police person said, oh, well, um, I'm not really sure. The answer was yes. Every time you open a picture, you change the picture. You change the records of the picture. So I was a very, very bad handling of the evidence from the police. But again, it wasn't just the police. It was the prosecutors. So... I proved that I went about to see what the creation date was with one of my examples, the judge liked that. And I calculated uh, through the help of one of my colleagues, the probability that the SD card that they had was not contaminated because they had already lost five out of the seven items. So how can you be sure that this item was actually from that investigation or not something else? And the probability that it was not contaminated was less than 20%. So there was more than 80% probability that it was contaminated. That doesn't mean that it was. It means that the police could not prove that it wasn't, which is even worse, actually. And at the end, the, the judge said that um, you know, the prosecution failed to make their case and that uh, the police report was below the standards expected by the court. So he had no other option but to find the guy not guilty. So a lot of money and time was spent on that trial. Money that the prosecutors cost, the cost of the of the court, the cost of the defense lawyers who were paid by the public money because the guy was on legal aid, my money for legal aid, uh, my money for me to go to court for a day. All that money was wasted for nothing. If the prosecutors had asked an external uh, consultant uh, for an opinion, they would have known that they don't really have a case and they would have spent thousands. I estimate that cases like that in Scotland cost around 50,000 pounds. So imagine how many hundreds of hours and 50,000 pounds, like 55, 60,000 euros wasted for nothing. Um, these were all cases where uh, the evidence was for criminal uh, investigations. And uh, the digital evidence is the same, but it takes diff it covers different needs for different um, uh, kind of courts. So the next one was from employment uh, tribunal. And this was about a nurse that was going against the National Health Service where she was working, the hospital uh, trust. So the nurse was accused, she was fired actually because she used a, a work computer to go to a website called Bibo. Bibo is like Facebook, but it never became that big. So the IT staff, they just printed the list of the file names of the cookies from Bibo 
and gave them to HR on a piece of paper. No investigation to see what those cookies are. The cookies are the things that you see every time you go to a new website and they say, oh, we're using cookies, click yes to accept. And there are small text files that are saved on your computer. And next time you visit on the website, they make that website load faster and take you to more relevant content. So the human resources said that uh, she either used a proxy server to bypass WebSense. WebSense was a tool in, that was in, installed to prevent people from going to websites like that. Or she must have installed illegal software to bypass security. Which were both very bad accusations, but there was no proof about that. Excuse me. Excuse me, my mouth was going dry. And I look at the NHS computer policy, and it, it was from uh, 1999, I think, something like that, that it said um, it's okay to install programs as long as we check them for viruses. Now, nowadays, this is crazy. We don't do that. People are not allowed to install things on the on, on these computers, especially for the National Health Service. Okay, you cannot allow a nurse to do th things like that. What does a nurse know? You don't allow a lawyer to go into the operating room and tell a nurse what to do. So it, it, it was crazy that this, was, this, this rule was actually still valid. So they did not preserve any cookies or any forensic evidence. They just had the printout, they sent on the printer a list of the file names and that was it. So what I did is I actually installed uh, WebSense on my computer and tried to see how it works. I blocked Bebo, but I also, before I did that, I used a proxy server. A proxy server was a, ser it was a website where you go there and it opens up uh, a box and you type there the other website that you visit and no, nobody can find on your computer which websites you visit. But the proxy server actually leave a cookie on, of themselves. So the fact that there were Bebo cookies left on the computer means that she had not used the proxy server. Those cookies would never be there if she actually used a, a, a proxy server. So accusing her of that was just, you know, ignorant to say the least. And there was no evidence that she actually installed any other software, which would have been crazy, would be criminal now to allow someone to install software like that on a hospital computer. So the actual evidence used to fire her, I used without anything new, no new evidence at all. I used that evidence to prove that she didn't do any of that. Here are, I went to different Bebo websites, .com, .co, .at, and it created all those uh, cookies. The cookie file names were actually the same. They tell you the name of the website, but not the extension. They don't tell you it's .at or .com. So if you have this cookie, you know that the name of the website was Bibo, but you don't know which Bibo. Is the Ukrainian one, the Greek one, the .com, the .japan, the .whatever. So you wouldn't be able to tell. And as I said, I, I installed and examined WebSense. And the only thing that I could find is that if WebSense was properly installed and if Bebo was properly blocked, they would never, the nurse would never be able to go to the website, which means that the cookie would never have appeared on her computer. So if the cookie appeared on her computer, it means that WebSense did not block the nurse from going there. 
At the end, the nurse won the employment tribunal. The, the judge found in her favor and uh, she was paid for all the loss of income and, and damages. The next one was a case that didn't go to court. It was an employment case, but I was hired directly from the business. And the business owner came back from holidays and she opened the Microsoft Word and saw the open recent um, list. Uh, and there were documents that were not supposed to be accessed by her staff while she was away. Now, her computer was available to, for staff to use uh, because some things they should have uh, be allowed to access. And also uh, the computer was uh, connected to a specific printer that some people may need to use, but not going deep into the hard drive and look for uh, sensitive and confidential files. So someone actually checked those things and I had to find out who it was. Now, because there's only one login, the people did not log in with a different account. I couldn't know who, who actually logged in. So I look at the what I could find. Uh, I look at the locally accessed files and I look at temporary internet files. And I'm, I was looking at here and I found out that there was a big gap at some point from the temporary internet files that there were actually, if you look here from 29 of uh, July until the 2nd of uh, October, there's a gap, everything was missing. So someone had deleted all the temporary history. Someone had tried to sanitize that. And that meant that someone was trying to hide something. Then I look, that was the browsing history. I look at the downloads history and I found out that on September 15th, something had been downloaded. And it had been downloaded from a Yahoo account. And I know what it was, that, that it was the case, because I found that this is the format coming down from Yahoo. I found the actual Yahoo link. And it, over here, it actually had the username, the person who logged into the Yahoo account. And that belonged to one of the staff. And all those things were bits and pieces, but if you put them in a timeline, the one after the other, you would see that someone went to Yahoo. A few seconds later, uh, this file was downloaded, the, the attachment. And after that, a Word file appeared, which was had the name of a CV. So the employee actually did that. She opened up the CV, printed copies of her CV, uh, left and while she was printing things out, she was going through confidential files uh, on the computer. So I put them all together and I made the report and um, as I said, all those things by themselves were not enough, but if you put them on a on a timeline, they tell a story. Um, there was also a record that uh, an external drive had been attached, so files were copied. It was the same time as the other things were being printed, so it was the same user. And when the employee was uh, faced with the uh, with my report and the timeline, uh, she just quit and she left the office and never came back. And that end, they end up there. They didn't go to an employment tribunal. But as you can see, as, as an employment lawyer, you may need to help your client uh, go for an investigation for even that means that there is something can be found even if, even if you don't go to court. Um, of course, you need different preparation of your evidence when you go to court rather than when you're doing it internally through when you give it to a manager. But an expert witness should know how to create those reports 
according to the audience that they're intending to. And the next one was um, a really funny one. Uh, someone was uh, working in the accounting uh, department of um, this uh, hotel and resort uh, business and a client walked uh, into the account department and saw that the one of the members of the staff was watching porn on the desktop and it looked like the girls in that movie were very young so i was called to investigate the computer of the employee who was suspended at the time and while i started the the brief from the client changed and i said that they need the second investigation because that employee was the sponsor of the manager who was American. And he was responsible to reply to emails from the home office, the Department of the Interior in the UK uh, for um, the renewal of his work permit. The employee said that he never received um, uh, these emails and he was not watching porn. So I had to investigate both of those things, which were quite different things altogether. So I investigated the hard disk drive. Um, the employee denied having watched porn, obviously. So I started looking at that. And if you look here, you can see that I found information on the, this is, the, this is from the computer. So these are search words. And the word that I searched for was UK border agency. And that's a department of the home office. And if you look here, it shows the link to the pages. And those links were actually, I followed later on, you will see them, but those links were actually part of the email because there were email addresses here. And this is when I searched for keywords related to porn. And that was not uh, the pictures themselves, that was about files and websites. And if you look at here, they, I had like more than 54,000 uh, hits returned. And the emails that had to do with the uh, home office, as you can see here, every one of these records show that these were the, from an email called final reminder. So the emails not only had been sent, well, the, because the, the, the home office would say, I, we, all, we send those emails. The question is whether the person actually read the emails. And this is evidence that the emails were read. This is not just a copy of the inbox, this is a copy of the email. So someone must have clicked on that email and that open email, is now stored on the hard drive. This is what you see here. And if you look at here again, homeoffice.gov.uk, that's the government website, how many times, how many hits I had. And in total, I had 223 hits from the keywords, home office, um, and the different parts that you see here. And I followed one of those links and they took me not to any other page of the home office because the home office has so many thousands of pages. It took me to that specific one from UK visa and immigration, which was about logging in and renewing uh, someone's um, a green card. So as you can see here, the information was there all i needed was was literally there then i looked at the browsing history from social media and from porn websites a lot of them had actually lost some of the, the information so like dates and times so i didn't know exactly how how far back they would go so I made this table that would say anything from six months to four years, because the guy was there, was given this new computer four years ago. So I played with the average different scenario. 
And the average was that he would have 74 visits on social media a, a day and he would spend 111 minutes a day. That's almost two hours being on Facebook and other social media. And another hour on average, what's important? So he was watching porn around five hours a week, almost one day of his week in the office, in the accounting department, on a desktop, he was watching porn. These were estimates based on statistics that I searched for. And the, local, the total amount of time that he was using was like two hours, 49 minutes a day or 14 hours a week. 14 hours a week is one and a half days a week spending on social media and porn. So interpreting the digital evidence is important, putting things into context and presenting them in the way that your audience will understand. more of a family court case now. And there was a case where a mother was concerned about her husband visiting extremist websites. So the, the, the husband was a Palestinian and the mother was um, uh, Irish. And his behavior had changed, he was becoming very erratic and he was going to all these Arabic websites and the, the wife was afraid that he was visiting uh, extremist websites. So I got hold of the drive of the, of the family computer, start investigating. This was the actual uh, drive. And I start going through the, the browsing history, but it turns out that those Arabic websites were not extremist. They were actually pirate websites where the guy was going to download, uh, illegally download music and movies and, and broken software and things like that. So totally different from what it was expected. But then while I was looking at the drive, I realized that there was a lot of space missing and I could not see where that, how that space was taken. So I looked for um, hidden folders and I found a hidden folder and inside that hidden folder was screenshots from a keylogger. For those of you who don't know, a key logger is a piece of software that is running on your computer in stealth. So I put it on Alexander's computer when I borrow his laptop to check my emails. I put it there and Alexander doesn't see anything. And every time the computer is being used, I am, it's taking screenshots and recording your, what you type, your passwords and everything. So it was a very interesting thing because in that folder, there were a quarter of a million screenshots. Then there were eye opener about what the husband was doing. First of all, the husband started going into his wife's email account, uh, reading her private emails. Um, the wife was having an online affair with someone, uh, but he was downloading the pictures that were sent, he was copying her um, messages, he would access her mobile phone records on, uh, on the web. Uh, and the screenshots would, from the key logger that he installed were actually recording those things. Of course, he didn't expect that anyone would find them. And the screenshots are indiscriminate. They, if you set them to every 15 seconds to take a screenshot, every 15 seconds there's a screenshot, no matter what. So this is where the actual the guy was actually using this program, which was used to uh, look at people's uh, uh, passwords, like this one here. So he found the wife's Facebook and Bibo accounts and her passwords. Uh, this one was well, he actually took. Uh, he actually copied the entire conversation of this email 
And you see, it's the moment he's actually clicking copy on his, uh, on his screen. And then what would happen is between 7 and 7.30, he would watch porn every, every morning. And then he would go to work. Before going to work, he would go here and delete his browsing history. So whoever used the computer would not see what he was doing earlier on. He then claimed that uh, he put the key logger because he was concerned his 11 year old son was watching porn. Now, I've got all this evidence, but I need to make sure that I can prove that it was himself doing those things and not the wife. And that was actually easy because the screenshots would have a date and a time taken from the computer. And all this browsing with the porn websites and the copying of her, the wife's emails and everything were at a time that the wife was at work and the wife was a nurse. So working in a government hospital. So her shifts, the times that she was at work or was not at work was a matter of government record. There was no dispute about whether his wife was at, at, at work that day or not. So it was always at the time that he was alone at home and the wife was at work. So in this case, we can put the person behind the keyboard, which is often a very difficult thing to do. And that guy, he had provided so much information through the key logger he installed himself. That's why we say he was digging his own grave. I did not even need specialist forensic tools. I just used the evidence he was collecting himself. That's the folder. These are the things he was downloaded, like movies and software. And this is a screenshot from the keylogger of the email where he actually bought the keylogger. He was using it for like a free month for a trial period. And then he opened, he, he actually bought the, the license. So you see here, he actually bought the key and received it in his email address after he had used his own credit card. So there was no question that it was him who put that software without telling his wife. That's the actual keylogger. And this is when you install it, you make things uh, stealth and nobody knows that the program is running on the background. So, um, that's it in terms of my presentations. Uh, you can scan any of these to contact me. You can find me on LinkedIn or uh, on Twitter, or you can uh, find my profiles in the Law Society or Napier University. And now I'm open to uh, any questions, anything you would like to discuss. Uh, Brazil, uh, uh, I will ask you in Ukrainian on the Senate for Society. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Brazil, таке питання: чи було у вас в практиці ситуація, коли uh, докази спотворюються uh, саме поліцейськими або стороною uh, обвинувачення? Until someone puts any questions or maybe a few things that I can say is that um, when um, 
an expert witness prepares a report, usually they will adapt the report to their audience. So uh, if you take it to court, you need to make it more formal. If you're taking to a to a business, to a manager who doesn't, is not technical, you need to make it less technical. Um, if you just want to prove a single point, you just go for that point. If it's a private case, if it's a court, you have to be very objective, you have to be very careful every word you choose. Um, with the criminal cases, we have the problem that the police, when there is a suspicion of a crime being committed or a crime being reported, they need to investigate anyway. Okay, they need to, to say, you know what, um, we have these suspicions, we need to investigate, we need to investigate this computer. Usually the police are the ones who will write the report and give it to the prosecutors and the prosecutors need to read the report and make a decision. Okay, they will decide if they have enough evidence to prosecute some. They're the ones who need to read the report carefully and understand it. Because the report, the police report, can be misinterpreted if you don't understand what exactly it says. And if you are a prosecutor and you are not technical, you need to call the police who wrote the report, uh, call the officer and say, I'm reading your report, I'm in page 12, and you say this, what does that mean? Because the, the police do not have any option. They will report whatever they find. Whether it is good enough for the prosecutors to use it or not, it's not their problem usually. It's the prosecutor's problem. And this is now where the mistakes happen. My experience, as I said, 15 years ago, the police were doing many mistakes, but they don't do so many mistakes now. They're getting better and better. It's the prosecutors who are being left behind. And also, it is the defense lawyers who make the mistake when they don't ask for, for an expert to help them. If the case, a criminal case has digital evidence, you know, mobile phone records or internet records or child pornography or anything like that, it's quite easy. You hire, you say, I need a computer forensic expert to look at the evidence. But if the police have not, or the, the prosecutors have not presented any digital evidence, it doesn't mean that there is no evidence your client is accused of being at the crime scene. Okay, and you may have some small pieces of evidence, but not so solid. Can you prove that your client was somewhere else? Did you go through the social media? Were they in a, in a club, in a par partying or doing something else? Were they in a restaurant? They were taking pictures of this posh uh, new dish from this uh, posh new restaurant. They were putting them on Instagram. Did you look at the mobile phone operator to see if they were anywhere near the locals? And often the evidence is going to be um, from other places. Actually, uh, we still have time. I'll, while I'm talking, I'm just gonna look at this other case. I can just bring it up. Uh, so, as I was saying, the important thing to understand is that if you do not, if you are not a forensic expert, you need to ask for help. As a lawyer, you need to assume that almost every case you handle has in one way or another digital evidence. 
if you have a contract, there will be emails exchanged, there will be PDF files exchanged, there will be online signatures, there will be this, there will be that. There will be terms and conditions when you go to a website. All those things need to be examined. So, any, any actual questions, anyone else? Um, I have one additional question, and, maybe, and after maybe uh, you can ask for Sawa question. Yeah. Uh, additional question is uh, uh, which your recommendation about fixing uh, uh, um, uh, fixing digital evidence from a Facebook account from a social network account? How to identify person who makes some uh, uh, post some information uh, if uh, this information or post illegal in your practice how you fix uh, identification of this person that's a very that is a very good question there is many ways that you can deal uh, with um, um, how do you call it that you can deal with um, uh, with evidence. Uh, first of all, if someone posts something and they're posting threatening messages or def um, defamating uh, messages, um, one of the things that you can do is look at the language that they use. So you may actually download all those messages, preserve them, and have a second expert and linguist. Uh, expert look at the language and see uh, the particulars of that person's expressions and then you can start searching those expressions online on social media with different tools and then you can find matches of the same be online behavior the same expressions on other postings and in the other postings the person may have actually have the real name because th that one was not something that they supposedly uh, would hide. Okay, so that is that is something um, that uh, you know it's it's worth understanding that digital evidence can take so many forms. Okay, uh, you can lo also look at people's. Um, um, not just the behavior uh, like that, but you will, obviously you have to look at uh, identity records, let's say on Facebook. So you identify a user. I can, it can be a user that appears to be me, but is it actually me or is it somebody else? So you need to make the case, identify the user, identify as much information, and then take them to a court, if you, if you are the police, you are doing it uh, in your own way. If you're a civilian, you have to take me to a court and say, well, these are our suspicions and we need to find the identity behind this particular user and we need a court order to do that. So you have to convince a judge to tell Facebook, for example, to give you the real name behind that person. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's very important. It's very uh, to to understand the difference between the so many different forms of digital evidence. Sometimes people go on Twitter and they put things, and then they forget that their location services are on. So what you what happens is that they they set up an account and it's an anonymous blah blah blah, but the tweet tells you where the mobile phone was at the time that they send out the tweet. And there are websites where you can actually track web track a Twitter account. And you can find that Twitter account in the last two years where they were every time they were um, and they were tweeting. Okay. 
Let me show you another example, actually. I think that should be a true one. That will, I know. Can I read uh, you it uh, uh, for, for translation in Ukrainian? Uh, an example of uh, a case involving a husband and wife. How does uh, consent to access personal data occur when one of the spouses is against it? Okay, this is a. It's, if it is a family computer, let's say a desktop that, or a laptop that everybody is using, then and if there is only the same account used, there's, or there's no password, there's not a lot of expectation of privacy. If the wife is bringing the, the, the laptop to me, then I will, or the husband is bringing the laptop to me, I will have them as a private investigator, I will have them to sign a document saying, this is my laptop. And I, I'm telling you, I'm asking you to, to, um, to, to investigate. So something that I need to cover myself. So if you bring me a laptop, your wife cannot come and sue me afterwards. Okay, and say, oh, that Alexander gave you this laptop, but you know, that was mine. I will say, I'm sorry. I have this letter and it's signed by Alexander and he said it is his. So if she takes me to court, I will give it to the judge and I said, I'm sorry. I did in good faith, but you know, this is his signature. He's the one who lied. Uh, if it is to, to take prosecution, it's more complicated. Because to prosecute someone or for, uh, for the police to do something, they need, uh, they need more evidence and they need, uh, you cannot show up to the police and just give them a laptop and say, look at that. How did you get hold of the laptop? What is the chain of evidence? How do I know that you were not using the laptop for the last six months, creating all this evidence and then give it to the police saying, oh, that Savas was doing it. So we have, we have cases like that where the police is messing up like this. I had a case where, um, a woman goes to the police and they say, oh, uh, my ex-boyfriend sent me a message and he was angry and I'm afraid he might hurt his son. So the police officer at the police station had no idea about this. He was not a computer forensic uh, expert in the police. He was just a constable at the reception. So he gives the lady the email address and says, take some screenshots and email them here. So they get the, e the email with the screenshots. He gives them to a, a detective, a detective put them on a report. He goes to a judge. The judge knows nothing about digital evidence. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a warrant to go to his home, the guy's home and take his mobile phone. They go, they take his mobile phone, they put it on an evidence bag, they put it in a locker, they leave it there. Then they charge the person. Okay, his lawyers call me. I go and meet at the prosecutor's office, the prosecutor, the defense lawyer, the detective, everybody was there. They brought the mobile phone. I opened my laptop, connected the mobile phone to my laptop. I was working for an hour and everyone was behind my laptop so nobody could see what I was doing. And an hour later, I gave them the laptop back and that's it. The police had no idea what I did to that mobile phone. They had no idea because they did not give it to cybercrime, the cybercrime unit. They just kept it in an evidence bag. And they allow me to investigate before <laughs> the cybercrime unit investigated. So it's complicated. It's, it's really complicated. There's no, there's not a single answer for that. Let me see the questions. 
Yeah, Basil, I, I can uh, announce it. Uh, we have yes. a general question, like uh, what are the tips, techniques, uh, methods for storing evidence? Okay, storing evidence, that's a very good question. The investigators like the police or myself, uh, when we investigate a, a computer, we create an image of the a clone of the computer drive, okay, the hard disk drive. Um, or if it's a USB key or whatever, we can create a, a clone and we're working from the clone. The clone has everything, including the delete information. It is 100% the same as the original. And we do that so that we don't damage, we don't destroy anything on the original. Uh, we know that the clone is the same because we are running a, something that's called a hash value, which is like a fingerprint. And the fingerprint of the original and the fingerprint of the clone must be exactly the same. If they are not, if one byte is different, the whole fingerprint is different. You cannot tell how, you cannot tell how big the, 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 the difference is. So once you get the confirmation that they are both the same, you work from the clone. Um, the things that I do is that when I extract information, I save them to uh, on, on a disk drive that is used only for that investigation. And after I finish, I clean the drive and I, I format everything. So there's no way that something can be big mixed from a previous investigation. Now, when you have the evi original evidence, for example, you are a lawyer and your client says, oh, I found this or I'm suspecting this, this is my mobile phone. The first thing you need to do as a lawyer is to not touch them the device. And what I'm gonna say is gonna sound crazy, but here it is. If it's switched off, you must not switch it on. If it's switched on, you must not switch it off. You must leave it exactly as it is and call someone to take it from there. But what you do is that you must be prepared as a lawyer and you can have some evidence bugs. You can have a form where you write that Alexander came to my office today and 12.35 in at noon, he gave me this iPhone 5. And you put it in that bag, you seal the bag, you put your details on the bag. Basil comes the next day, he puts the, his information on the, uh, the chain of evidence. I take it, I investigate, I have to, the, the evidence bag cannot open. When it's sealed, it's sealed, you must cut it. Okay, so I cut it, take it out, work on it, and then I put it, I stick, put a sticker on top and I sign it. Or I put a new bag and I put the mobile phone and the old bag in the new bag. And I keep writing on the same form that I, you know, the number, because all those bugs are numbered. I put the new bug number. I say that the old bug is in the new bag together with the mobile phone, et cetera. What time I took it out, what time I took it, I put it in. And that's called the chain of evidence. And that's how you preserve the continuity of your evidence. So you don't know if you are a lawyer and your client comes to you, you don't know what happens before that, but you can know at any time from now onwards until two years later or three years later, where the, where the mobile phone was. Because every time you put it in a bag and you seal it, you know that it is there. Okay, and if I, it doesn't, I don't need it to have a safe. If, if, it's, if the mobile phone is in a bag in my office and two years later, the bag is unopened, I can tell you that nobody had touched the mobile phone. And that is the important thing. Lawyers don't do that. Big companies like KPMG and you know this kind of stuff, they, they, they are prepared for things like that. But everyday lawyers don't and you need training to do that. You need to be ready to do that. If you have something that is not 
tangible, it's not on a mobile phone or a computer, and it's online, you have another problem. If your client says, look at this link, this person wrote this thing about me. Then you need to have someone like me go to that link and download the information and preserve it in a format that I, I take it down and, and then I put them all together. I create a fingerprint of all the information. And next, if, a, if you want to give that information to someone else to investigate it, they will check the fingerprint of that file and it will be the same as the original. And you know that that evidence I downloaded that time has never changed. Another practical thing that you can do, which is not a proper computer forensic thing, but legally it can stand, is that if you have something online and you're not really sure how long it's gonna stay there, you send it to the printer. And if you yourself as a lawyer, you are also a notary public, you print it and you notarize, you stamp it. Or you send the link to another republic and said, this is urgent. Go there on that Facebook page, print everything, print three copies and start stamping and put your signature as another republic. Once you've notarized that, it, it will show where it came from. And if that post disappears, you at least have something that the court, the judge will say, wait a minute, is a third party not a republic? You know, they are not going to lie there. They're a reliable person, that's it. But that's a last minute, <laughs> last minute resort. Uh, generally, it is important that lawyers do not touch devices. Your client says, oh, I have, look at this, I have these pictures, or this person sent me these pictures on my WhatsApp or my email. Don't go and click on the pictures. Every time you click on a picture, you change it. The, the picture, the, the content of the picture is the same, but the information inside the picture is changed. If you have a laptop that is switched off, the moment you switch it on is a different laptop. If it switches off, I take the drive out and I create a clone, and then I, I create a fingerprint. If I put it back on the, on the laptop and press the button, the power button and it switches on, then when it switches on, things are happening with Windows. Some files are updated, some things are changing. Not a lot, the user doesn't see those things, but those things are happening in the background. If you then create a clone of the, the, the drive, it will have a different fingerprint. And I cannot tell from the difference of the fingerprints, nobody can tell how much has changed. Was it one terabyte of data that was changed or was it one single byte? There's no way of telling that. So it is legally and technically and scientifically a different computer the moment you switch it on. So that's why it's, it's important for lawyers not to handle evidence, and it's important for them to have a process in their practice when someone is bringing something in, either tell them something that's happening online or they bring a device, to have a protocol and follow the protocol. Because if I have given you a protocol and you follow that, and you have filled the, you know, all the paperwork and you have put things in an evidence box or an evidence bag, then I come and I take that and I said, okay, I know where this mobile phone was three hours ago. Savas had it and Savas had put it there three hours ago. He said so in writing and I'm continuing the work on the basis that apart from Savas who put it in the box, nobody has touched it the last three hours until I got it. Does that answer the question or is it too much? No, Basil, thank you. Uh, actually, we have uh, a few different questions. Sure, yeah. But, but related to the previous one, uh, it's more specific. 
whether, whether it's possible to detect interfere with metadata, metadata and when it cannot be detected. Right. Um, that's a very interesting one. Uh, if you have something without a context, usually you cannot, with the metadata, you, can, you will not be able to say necessarily that it's been changed or not. However, when you read the metadata you, and you look, for example, at, at the document, if it's a Word document, the Word document may have information about how many times it was changed before and updated you know, or edited. And you may have just gone and changed the one piece of metadata, which was the creation day. Okay. And you put the creation day of the original to be a year apart from the last changes, then there's a discrepancy there. If it is a picture, uh, one of the things that you may do is that you actually analyze the picture and see, is that picture real? You say this is a picture of, of Basil in um, the university. Is it the university? Yes. Basil said it's four o'clock in the afternoon when he took the picture. You, you look at that place and you look at the records and you look at that date and you see what was the weather like. If it was a bright sunny day and Basil was by the window and it was all dark, then something is wrong. Okay, so you're looking then to see is what you see in the picture making sense with the metadata. But also there is another thing. Metadata can also be misinterpreted, not necessarily uh, changed. So you need to understand what it means. For example, you can have a legitimate file that hasn't been altered and it tells you that the creation day is after the last access day. So it, it, you, it, the file can tell you that it was accessed last time on Easter Sunday, but it was created today. And that can be true. So for some people will say, oh, this looks suspicious, you know, uh, someone changed the date. But it doesn't necessarily mean, it may be the case that the copy of the file that you created, you copied that on this, on, on this laptop today. So the copy was created today and the creation day is when this copy, not the original was, and everything else on the metadata can remain the same. So you can sometimes have a creation day to be after the last change or the last access day. That as it may sound for conspiracy theories, it may sound <laughs> suspicious, but you know, there is an explanation. Um, also, um, you can have um, the, another context. If the pictures are part from a camera, for example, and you have a, a, a card where you save pictures from your camera, if you have the other pictures, and the, the, usually the file names are serial or they, have, they, they, they contain the date and the time, you might find out that you, know, you may have a picture that doesn't make any sense with the other pictures in the folder. Or there might be information in the, in the how do you call it, in the picture on the file name that is different from what you read in the metadata. So in that case, you know that it has been changed. Uh, but the answer is yes, you can change metadata. The problem with that is, can, did you change them correctly? Did you change them in a way that actually shows what you want to show? Or you actually make a mess and it becomes clear that it has been altered. So not everyone, every, everyone can change the metadata, but not everyone can do it right. Uh, some of the things, for example, with the metadata is that if you go on Windows Explorer and you right click on a file, 
and you go into the properties, it will say, oh, creation day, who was the author, whatever. You do that. And you can actually change something there. But you have to make sure that the last access date was not also changed. You change the creation date, what about the last access date? Um, there was a, a document, it was called uh, Yellow Hammer. Now, Yellow Hammer is, um, I think it's Yellow Hammer, I think it was a, a bird, but it's the name of the operation, Yellow Hammer, but the UK government that had a worst case scenario for Brexit. If you look at the Yellow Hammer document, the PDF, you can find in the UK government website. But that PDF was very suspicious. When I found it online, I had to check with the original and the original was suspicious. It was not a document that was created and then turned to PDF. It was on paper, somebody scanned it, put on a PDF and there were no metadata in it. Where other ones would say they were, you know, the author was the home office, last printed on that printer, you know, created by that or sent by that email address or, you know, turned to PDF by that program. There was nothing. Okay. So sometimes you, it may appear that the metadata are wrong. In that case, you need to find the origin of the document to uh, the, 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 the really original one. So when you go to the UK government website, then you say, okay, I found this, this is the original. If it has the same fingerprint, then that's it. It may look suspicious, but it's real. Um, there are tools that you can actually edit metadata. And you can do that online or you can download the tool. Um, but not always, but most of the times you, if you don't know what you're doing, you will miss something. So. Thank you, Basil. We, we have uh, another question, yeah. very practical and very useful for lawyers. How to confirm the fact of correspondence between parties? Uh, let's say send attachments, for example, agreements by mail. Is only access to server necessary to exclude correspondence forgery? Ah, that's, uh, that's interesting. One way of ensuring that um, your correspondence, especially when it's about contracts and very sensitive uh, private information, is to use a secure mail or to encrypt your emails and encrypt the attachments. You will have a public key and a private key for, uh, for the encryption. And if it's that shared between two parties, you know, if that's shared between you and me, I know that, you know, if I can, if I can open that encrypted one with my current key, it's coming from you. Okay. Um, practical things will be checking the sender. Who is the sender? But that can be spoofed, especially if the response is not about replying to the email; is about clicking on the attachment or doing something else. But some other things that you need to be careful are less technical and are more about um, social engineering. So frauds involving lawyers and frauds that have to do with money, they usually ha happen five minutes past, past five on a Friday. So you are my lawyer, you are taking care of my I'm buying a house and you are taking care of everything. So I'm supposed to send some money to your firm's account so you can put the deposit. Um, and I get an email 
apparently from you and we said, oh, Basil, uh, we've changed our bank details. This is our new bank details. Everything else seems all right. And it can even be your email address on the sender. So I believe that's the case. I go to my online banking, change my banking details, the banking details, and I send the money over there. 20 minutes later, the money is in China, you know, Monday, you send me an email. Oh, Basil, I'm still waiting for the money, for the deposit. I said, what are you talking about? I sent you 20,000 euros. No, I didn't receive the 20,000 euros. Five minutes past Friday. It's like clockwork. <laughs> okay, so lawyers should be careful. First of all, you should have some guidelines that you should make your clients understand and make it a term of your engagement. For example, you are not going to change the bank accounts during this interaction. Okay, so you started taking care of, of my buying a house. You, you have to send me a, a PDF or an email saying, Basil, here's the rules. We are not going to ask you, we are not going to change our bank accounts until you buy your house. If you get any email like that, it's not us. If you put the money there, we don't have your money. And that will help also your client, not only you. Your client will understand that if they get an email like that, it's suspicious. And instead of putting the money through their online banking, they should wait until Monday to get hold of you and talk about it. I had a case of a, a business who got uh, an email from, you know, um, from their client. No, they, they actually the other way around. Um, they, they got an email saying, oh, we changed our bank details with that Barclays account. And that Barclays account was um, an account that was used to send money abroad. So sending big amounts of money outside the country was not flagged that, that, that there was a company, but someone in that company illegally was using that account to, tra to traffic money. So they paid, they, they sent this invoice with the new bank details and the other side paid them, the client paid them a quarter of a million pounds, 250,000 pounds. And these are businesses that were working together for 20 years. So the person who received the email could have picked up the phone and said, hi, Sava, I've got this email. Uh, did you change your bank account? That was it. You don't need to be a cybersecurity expert. You need to use common sense. This is not about buying a coffee or you know, something like that. It's a quarter of a million pounds. Someone tells you put the quarter of a million pounds in a different bank account and you don't think to pick up the phone. There's so much you can do to help people uh, if they don't want to help themselves. So you need, the other thing is that uh, lawyers, you should provide this service to your client. You should provide some awareness of online fraud to your clients. You should tell them how easy it is to be defrauded. Let me actually, I'll, I'll, I've got this. Let me show you this. Just bear with me, I'll share it. Have a look at this one. Do you see the cat? Okay. So, Okay, just bear with me. Let's see some Ukrainian cats.
and let me see if that's going to open because there. There you go. So this is a website called I know where your cat lives.com. And it has gone around the internet a few years ago and it scoured the internet and it got a million pictures of cats. And uh, the pictures had GPS information in the metadata. So they can be seen, they can be superimposed on uh, um, Google Maps. And look at this. So this one picture is, is two girls that they look like cats because of their makeup. But what happens is that people make more and more, put more and more pictures of their cats. Now, if you have a single picture of your cat, it's not a lot. If you have 40 or 50 pictures of your cat from your apartment, I'm taking those 50 pictures and putting them together and I have a setup of your apartment. Then I'm looking exactly at your address. I find out who lives there. It's very easy. I found you on Facebook. And if I, if I don't know exactly because it's apartments, it's 10 families, I found 10 names. I look all of them on Facebook. One of you, one of those 10 accounts or 20 accounts that I find is gonna have pictures of this cat. So I know it's you, if this is your cat. I start following all your social media. I know when you're going on holidays. I know when there's no, no, anyone gonna be there. That's why I go and burglar your home. Thank you very much. People will do the same thing for other things. You have a Christmas party office. You take pictures while you're in the office, fine. You take a pictures and there's computers on the background. There's people who have actually put their passwords and their logins on a post-it note on the screen while they were working. I zoom on that one, I've got the, your passwords. You just put them on, uh, on Instagram. See? And let me stop this and let me show you something else, uh, which is, um, just bear with me. Uh, ask, what's the next question uh, while I'm looking for things? Sure, uh, cats always a success story. So I believe you're looking for dog stories right now. <laughs> <laughs> of, course it's, of course, it's a joke, but the next question it's about VPN. If VPN uh, was constantly turned on all the time, is it possible in this case to identify the person and there they came from? Ah, okay. Here's the thing that with the VPN. The thing with the VPN is the same thing as the end of end-to-end -end encryption you have on your messaging apps like WhatsApp, but even Signal. VPN makes sure that when you and Alexander are connected and I find your connection, I cannot read it. I can look at the signal, I can intercept because I can intercept the, uh, the IP address of Alexander or yours, but all I see is something that is scrambled, so I cannot read it. However, your service provider and Alexander's service provider know that both of you are actually using a VPN. They don't know what you are exchanging, but they know that you are using the VPN. Which means that if you are investigating, if there is an international criminal investigation through Interpol and things like that, and they involve the providers, you cannot see what is being exchanged. For example, terrorist material, child pornography. 
But you know that this IP address belongs to NordVPN, one of the VPNs. I, I'm using NordVPN, that's why I said uh, one of the services. So I'm the Interpol is suspicious that you are exchanging material with Alexander, um, but you are using one VPN and Alexander is using another VPN, uh, but Interpol cannot see what you are exchanging, but they know that your IP addresses are uh, VPNs. Then they get the records from your provider saying that you start using that VPN that date and time. And then the VPN provider will never give you anything because they don't keep any logs, they don't keep anything. That's the, the magic of the VPN. But you can start co connecting the dots who is using VPN at what time. And then you create enough connections and then you say to Interpol, says to the Ukrainian police, you know what, uh, these two guys are, they're exchanging, um, you know, material and uh, uh, every time the one connects on VPN, the other one connects on, on VPN. And it happens the same, you know, it's not, it doesn't happen once, it happens a hundred times that Alexander connected on VPN, a hundred times Savas was on the VPN. Okay, and we know, and here's the thing, we know that Alexander received something, we don't know what, from Savas VPN IP address. Of course, Basil can be using the same uh, VPN address from, uh, from Scotland. But eventually, the more, the more samples you have, the more connections you make, and then it's more easy to actually get a warrant. And then the police come to your place, they pick up your laptop, and then they find things on your laptop because the things are not encrypted. But it's a complicated thing. It doesn't happen everything. And, you know, and certainly you cannot use it for uh, private investigations, you know, uh, like that, because you need warrants to get from service providers. Service providers are not going to, you know, provide you information because you think your girlfriend is cheating on you. You know, they, they, they provide information when it's a crime or national security but not for private things like that. And never without a court order, even the police. Uh, in the UK, the only time that operators provide information to the police, if there is a crime being committed as we speak and the imminent threat to life. So either a terrorist is gonna blow up a bomb or someone has kidnapped someone and you're trying to follow the kidnapper. Anything else, you have to go to a judge and get a warrant. Yeah. Thank you, Basil, uh, for the answer. And maybe the last question, because we are exactly on the time. Have you had the practice of researching information from a damaged hard drive? How to store a damaged hard drive so that the information is not destroyed? Good question. Um, from a damaged drive or a damaged device, you need to have um, some people with extra uh, skills uh, which would be technical skills. Uh, sometimes, so for example, you can take the damaged drive, take the pieces out. If it's, an, let's say, the old drive, the mechanical drive, take all the plates out and then put them on a new drive and try to restore it. Um, it's not always working. Uh, sometimes from CDs or DVDs, um, you can treat them with special material. So if there's any scratches like that, you can kind of fill in some gaps. Um, or sometimes you just accept the fact that you can recover some information, but not everything. So, um, but we have now tools that can be more aggressive when they're imaging things. And what you also need, what you need to do is to actually create a clone of the, um, uh, of the damaged drive and try to get all the information from the clone. 
So it, anything that goes wrong happens on the clone, doesn't happen on the original. So you, you can still preserve uh, the evidence. And if you manage to get things from the clone, you know that they will still remain on the original. Uh, it's some some damages on the drives can be can be fixed by software, uh, but some things are hardware damage which you need to fix, you know, using your hands, and that doesn't always work. There is a process for mobile phones called chip chip off, where you actually remove information from the actual chip on the mobile phone. But that is a very specialist process. I mean, I know the process, but I've never done it. So I, if I need, I will have to find someone who is expert in chip off uh, process to do it for me. Okay. There is, there's a lot of little things like that in uh, digital forensics and dealing with evidence. Um, and for an expert, it's important, you know, if you if you consider yourself an expert, you need to know where your limits are and not try to do things that you shouldn't be trying. For example, if I have a something that I need a chip off thing, I will never touch the, the chip. I will look around, I will find someone who is good, and I will say, how much are you going to charge me? I need you to do this job for me. But I have done, and I have a couple of colleagues who are doing who are good with hardware. And I have, I have had some complete, I had a, this, this mobile phone that was broken on the screen and it was actually bended like that. Okay. And she still made it work. So he made it work. And after he made it work, I used my tools and I extracted everything. But this is the other thing. If you want to destroy evidence, or from a, from a device, but of course there's always online backups like iCloud and stuff like this. But if you want to destroy uh, evidence, it's not that hard. If you if you want to be on a standby to destroy your drive, you need to your on your laptop. You need to put an X at the bottom of your laptop where your drive is. So if you need to do it quickly, you know where to to put a nail through there <laughs> with a hammer. That's, so that's the, 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 that's how you would do it. Thank you, Basil. If we have opportunity to ask the last question, the latest. I, I'm, I'm fine, okay? I'm fine. I can stay longer, so I'm fine to ask to, for more questions. Don't worry. Okay, so the question is, uh, let's say, seems simple, but not so simple. How is correspondence uh, recorded in messengers as evidence? Sorry, what's the question again? Uh, when uh, parties write some information in messengers, how we can record it as a evidence? Uh, how we record it as evidence? Okay. Yes. When you... <sighs> When you get things out of a particular, um, uh, how to call it, out of a particular um, mobile phone, let's say, um, that's the evidence from from your part. To corroborate that, you need the other side. Okay, or you need to make sure that. Whoever appears to be on the other side is is the real account and is not is not spoofed. It's easy to do that, easier to do that when you're using things like a, a WhatsApp or you know telephone uh, messengers. Okay, because in WhatsApp, I've got, let's say uh, Alexander's number. We exchange. I can always go and check in his profile and see which number I'm sending the messages to or which number is sending the message to me. Where if it's a, a Facebook messenger, I only see a name. Okay. And I don't know who is behind that. 
because someone can have a messenger without having a Facebook account or they can have a Facebook account that is uh, fake but good enough to trick me. So the only way to be sure is to, to have both sides uh, of the conversation. But in most cases, that is not often required. Um, <laughs> I had a case where that was actually confirmed. Uh, remember I told you about the case earlier about the guy who had two pictures of child pornography that the police uh, uh, failed in their, um, uh, in their work and the prosecution. Uh, a year later, his lawyer called me back and said, oh, remember our friend? Um, He's in trouble again. I said, what, pictures? No, 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 no. He was chatting with two 14-year-old girls. I said, really? He says, well, I say 14-year-old girls. They were undercover agents from the Metropolitan Police. So they arrested him. They got his mobile phone. The conversations were there. But the originals were actually with the Metropolitan Police anyway. So everything... <laughs> Uh, everything was a match. So there was, it, it, got, it was so good that there was no defense. Okay, he, there was nothing. You know. But um, I found out that most of the cases, in cases like that, it's up to the judge to decide whether they will admit only the one side or not. And usually they do. And usually they do because the people who do, who have chats like that, they chat with other people as well. They don't just chat with the one that is of interest to the case. So if I have a hundred people that are messaging, you know, then that's my account. You know, you can confirm that I've been messaging with all the other people. So that chat there is mine as well. You cannot just say, you know, oh, someone hacked my mobile phone and did that. So it, it, it's just a matter of, um, uh, just a matter of, uh, you know, doing things properly. Let me just show you something quickly before we go. Um, Uh, talk about um, law firms you you know Mossack Fonseca eleven and a half million documents, not pages, documents. If you say that the average legal document is, let's say, 10 pages, it's 115 million pages. Paradise Papers, the same story. Uh, countries affected by the Paradise Papers. Almost half the planet. But let me show you something else, actually. Um, so look at this. This is a, a nuclear decommissioning facility in England. High, sec highly secure place, you know, uh, armed police uh, and everything. And how do you get access to that? How do you find people who work there and try to get access? You go on Tinder. Okay. People put on Tinder that they work in a nuclear <laughs> decommissioning facility. Okay, so much for security. But this is evidence. So you, if you are doing an investigation about the security of your business, and if you are a nuclear plant, you go on Tinder, you start scanning for people in, in the area who are working, and eventually you find that. You take these things, and then you, you take an... An, 
you know, HR is now, is then dealing with those things. This was a private investigation for me to actually find things. I was not working for the decommissioning facility. But, you know, this is the thing with digital, in the digital world, things can go wrong easily, very fast from a stupid things like this. And I went on Tinder and I looked at uh, female profiles in central Scotland and I cropped the pictures, put them on Google images to find a match. I found uh, Facebook and LinkedIn matches. I found names, addresses, names of the children, names of the pets, things like that. Every, I didn't hack anyone. I didn't invade anyone's privacy. These are all things that were online. Okay. Ah, about the cats. These are my cats, actually. Fifi on the left and Alfie on the right. Alfie looks like a superhero. Fifi is the sweetest little thing. And this is in Scotland. Look at this one. Okay. Look how many pictures were from one single address. Of course, you can stalk people using this kind of information. And you can trick people by using fake domain names like this one. Facebook and Google are available to buy for 839. If you see one of the O in Facebook and Google is, is bigger, it's Greek from Greek characters. And look at this one, as there is a supermarket in, in, in the UK, not this particular one. Look at this one, British Airways. Can you notice anything? The third eye doesn't have a dot in Airways. Okay, that is Turkish. Turkish alphabet. The Turkish alphabet has two eyes, one with a dot and a silent one without a dot. Look at these domain names. These have no dots at all, so you cannot spot the difference. So it's actually better quality. Who owns these domain names? Me. I bought them for a proof of concept. How easy it is for me to trick people now. That was my old website pointing at British Airways. Then I made this one even better. This is the real British Airways.com, but it has all the eyes, obviously. And then I tried Netflix, but Netflix was taken. So I, I clicked there and I went to this website and I found this very strange advertisement, which I knew was fake and took me to these websites, which were exactly the same, different domain names made to look like the mirror newspaper. And they're all fraud for blockchain fraud. Blockchain fraud, blockchain fraud. Mm. more blockchain fraud. This one looks like the BBC. If you look at the domain name, it changes. It changes every time. It's the same material. So that's organized crime. That's not a, a random one-off fraudulent website. More, more fraud. And even Bitcoin, the official website says that everything like that is a fraud. There is no method, there is no things. It's, it's a risk investment like everything else you invest. Uh, online fraud with uh, phishing emails during the COVID. You know, like the World Health Organization is gonna send you attachments and they ask you to pay by Bitcoin. <laughs> And if you are looking at people, in this one, I was looking for myself. 
every picture, I was Googling my name, Basil Manousos, was some time ago. Every picture here has to do with me, even if I'm not in the picture. It's from articles that I have written. It's from websites where my name is mentioned. It's from where people tagged me, from colleagues from the university, you name it. Every single picture. And do not ask me about this one in the bottom. I cannot discuss this, I'm sorry. And, and sometimes... Thank you, in, Basil. <laughs> So oh, Facebook, I had uh, my name as Vasilis, not Basil. And I never put Basil. And my friend Adrian actually tagged me as Basil a few years ago during a Christmas night out. Okay. Ever since when you're looking for Basil Manusos, it will show up because the connection was made once. And this one is a Greek Orthodox church in Glasgow. And I used my Gmail account to register the, their website on Google Maps. And because it was my Gmail, my name is connected. Every time you Google my name in, in Google Maps in, in west of Glasgow, it's going to have this thing. My name is nowhere on the website, but the connection is made. And that's me on Google Earth, on Street View. And if you know that I have a cat, you Google my name and the cat, you find information about my cat, and then you find more information about me. Like this one, if you knew the street that I lived and you didn't know the, the number, you go on street view and you look for Boo-Boo, my cat. And there is Boo-Boo. If Boo-Boo is there, that's where I live. So much for, for evidence. So, Thank you so Thank much, you. Basil. I hope you enjoyed it. Very much, Basil. I, I'd like to pass the floor to Alexandra just to finalize uh, our event today, but uh, I'll give you a few feedbacks uh, in a chat uh, which wrote our lawyers. Uh, they are very positive, uh, very fruitful event, and uh, uh, you scared them away. Uh, oh, because no, 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 no. The, the, they they uh, they promise to delete all the social medias <laughs> because if you find a cat in uh, Ukrainian cities, that means that uh, let's say uh, our animal animal uh, enemy enemies can find uh, anything that we they want. So yes. uh, it's a it's an important question for national security, of course, and uh, it's an important question for everyday lawyers' practice. So, uh, believe thank me, you very much. Believe me, uh, my scary presentation was not this one. I have other scary presentations, and scary scary ones for lawyers, especially. Uh, the the very first scary one I actually did on Halloween a few years ago. It was on Halloween, so I did a Halloween presentation that really scared them. But um, I have to say, look at, you know, with Ukraine, there are so many bad things happening with uh, Russian troops right now, but there's gonna be evidence. Some of those people will take pictures of what they do, or they will take pictures nearby of what they did, and that puts them in the area. But one of the things that people, you know, you know, people like me, you know, we're talking about those things, but it was on the news uh, last year. Mobile phone operators in Ukraine can identify and separate the Ukrainian SIM cards from the Russian SIM cards. So you can locate near which antenna are your SIM cards, the Russian SIM cards, and you know, your, your army can know exactly where, where the Russians are. Of course, that can include Ukrainians who have been using Russian SIM cards uh, for private use before. But then again, you would still be able to find out if that is an old SIM card that it's on the network for, for the last five years, or if it's something that came to your network after February last year. So uh, technology allows you to do that, those things. And when you arrest someone and you find that SIM card in their mobile phone, 
you've got now evidence of where that SIM card has been. And that person would have been there. Sorry to interrupt the closing. I just. <laughs> No, no, it's a good, it's not just a bad thing, but usually it's a positive thing as well. So thank you, Basil. Oh, Basil, thank you very much for your election, uh, for our Ukrainian colleagues. And uh, I hope it not last uh, uh, election and we will make some courses, special uh, courses, maybe when, when you return from uh, your Interpol election in July or July, we will <laughs> wait you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing I'm finishing uh, first week of June actually so after that uh, uh, we can start scheduling and as I said uh, I'll be happy to schedule some longer lectures for uh, for digital evidence and specialize a bit more but also some uh, threat awareness and cybersecurity awareness for lawyers so you will know how to protect yourself protect your data uh, not only on digital evidence. So happy to discuss that uh, with uh, Alexander and Sava. Uh, we can have a, a Zoom call sometime and uh, and discuss it. And I'll I'll be happy to put something on the diary. And, uh... Okay, S thank you and and thank you for your support to Ukraine and Win, for your knowledge uh, and your uh, lecture for evidence in digital evidence because now world became a digi digital digitalization growing up uh, that's why we need uh, this knowledge and this sphere of education actually for uh, advocates actually for uh, ukrainian fighting for justice thank you very much thank you very much uh, for having me thank you very much for uh, uh, all this participation and also for all these questions it's actually good when you have a presentation, people actually ask questions because sometimes you don't get any questions and you say everybody was it was boring for everyone. No, nobody had a simple question. So uh, it, it pleases me when people actually have questions. Um, as I said, the conversation had started with uh, Alexander about helping um, uh, in this uh, uh, tough time for Ukraine, but Digital evidence and cybersecurity are not only for wartime, they are forever, for, for every time. And, you know, life continues no matter what's happening on the borders. Uh, the rest of the country will, as I see, are trying to continue uh, living their, trying to make as much normal of a life. And in, and in that sense, you still have issues as lawyers of cases about fraud, about divorces, about you know, stolen uh, IPs, you know, all, all these kind of things. And today, the, my, my seminar was about to, to, for you to understand that digital evidence comes in many forms, but it is, you know, uh, for every kind of litigation and criminal, uh, and criminal uh, um, action. So there, you know, some things are more often, you know, in Scotland, for example, uh, child pornography is one of the biggest issues in the digital evidence with the police, but that's that's just the thing, you know, there, there's still other issues. And that's the problem that some some online crimes will are likely to go unpunished because if it's done properly, like online fraud, uh, if it's a small piece of fraud, somebody stole 500, you know, tricked you and you paid 500 euros, the police is not going to spend a lot of time over that because it's not in the public interest. They're not going to spend 100,000 euros to find your 500. They'll just put on a file and, you know, <laughs> if something comes up in the future, that's it. Uh, so it's uh, electronic crime is, is unpunished. Uh, that's not a Ukrainian thing, it's a world thing. And threats for lawyers are the same. There's a hacker group called Maze, and they actually, they were having, they developed their own, um, um, how do you call it, uh, malware, uh, ransomware, and they were th throwing it around and, you know, 
give us a hundred dollars and we'll give you your data back. And then they realized, wait a minute, we're going for individuals. Some of them, they will not give you the hundred and they will just wipe their drive and put everything from scratch. Um, you know, it takes a lot of time. Why don't we go after lawyers? Okay, American law firms asked for two or three million dollars uh, for from uh, its law firm. That's how you make the money. They even had, you know, consensus. Uh, you know, they will say, "Oh, if you cannot pay that, you can work with us." And uh, so, if you can help us, uh, you know, compromise two or three other law firms, we can give you your data back for free. So uh, anyway, I'm not going to take any more of your time. Thank you very much. Um, Alexandra and, uh, and Sava, let's have a, a call sometime soon yeah. and, and see what kind of more seminars or even a full course for the HSA we can actually, uh, I'll, I'll be happy to actually formalize a course that you want to, all your members to have. And at the end, you can issue them a certificate of attendance or something. So. Actually, it's a good idea because in the chat, there is a lot of uh, comments. Uh, Basil said, it's just the beginning. <laughs> so we expect it to, to continue on. So I'll, I'll, I'll be happy. I'll be happy to have more of these, as I said, and I'll be happy to arrange for some, uh, um, uh, some training. And uh, as I said, um, if it's something that it will be valuable to your, uh, to your membership, uh, to, to create these courses, uh, you know, so you, you can actually raise a level among your membership so that you can say, you know what, they, you can issue a certificate to those people and say, those people attending this course, five, 10, 20 hours, whatever the course is going to be, and they have this level of knowledge. So when they go to the client or when they go to court, the judge or the client will see that, oh, they, they have a level of understanding. But it will also help them see when they need to ask for help. And that is a bigger lesson for lawyers, to know when to ask for help. It's true. Thank you. Thank you, Basil. Thank you for your effort and thank you for the support to Ukraine. Thank you. It's, you. A, it's a pleasure and uh, um, happy to help. Thank you. Thank you, Basil. Same thing. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, I, I do not see the rest of the people, but goodbye to everyone. And uh, really they happy. See you. <laughs> they see you. Of course. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.